welcome to AI with Sally, a podcast that takes a closer look at some of the most interesting technology stories on artificial intelligence and machine learning. We'll hear about the latest in hardware and software that has a big impact on the world of AI. I'm your host, Sally ward foxton Welcome back to another episode of AI with Sally. Today's episode is brought to you by our sponsor, Acronix. In this episode, I'll sit down with Krishna Rangasai, CEO of Simmer.ai, to talk about the company's software-centric strategy and hopefully find out a few details of the company's Edge SoC with homegrown AI Accelerator, something the company doesn't really talk about very much, despite having excellent ML Perf scores for power efficiency in particular. You can hear that interview with Krishna Rangasai later in this episode. First up, here's some AI news you may have missed from eetimes.com. The CEO of OpenAI, Sam Altman, was on stage at Intel Foundry's event recently during a fireside chat with Pat Gelsinger. Altman's been widely reported to be looking for investment to the tune of $7 trillion from investors in the Middle East, supposedly to build a foundry or a network of foundries, perhaps. At Intel's event, Altman said, you shouldn't believe everything that you read in the press. We assume he meant everywhere other than the New Times. And he did clarify a little bit on the $7 trillion. He said, everybody is underestimating the need for a lot of AI compute. He's obviously painfully aware that there's a huge gap between how much compute his vision of the AI-driven future will require and what will be available. And he seems to have identified that the current bottleneck for AI compute at scale is foundry and packaging capacity. While it seems unlikely that OpenAI could become an IDM or start a foundry itself, I think Altman's probably hoping that hyping up AI's future will make a start on convincing the industry that more foundry capacity will be needed, so they better start building. You can read that full story at eetimes.com. ARM has updated its Neoverse CSS designs with new CPU cores, which are aimed at companies building their own custom chips for the data center based on ARM. CSSs are ARM's oven-ready subsystem designs that combine SOC elements to give customers a head start. ARM also has an ecosystem of design partners to help with implementation of these CSSs if required. The overall aim is to make the path to custom silicon faster and more accessible. The recently announced Microsoft Cobalt 100 is based on second-gen CSS, specifically CSSN2. ARM said it has customers running AI inference at scale on ARM-based CPUs, in part down to the cost and availability of accelerators today. ARM's vision is for a significant percentage, if not the vast majority, of AI inference to run on CPUs eventually, particularly as models become more optimized for CPU hardware. ARM also expects its CSSs to be used in tightly coupled CPU plus accelerator designs analogous to NVIDIA's Grace Hopper. To read more on ARM's new CSSs and for a few details on the new cores, head over to eetimes.com. Canadian chip startup BlueMind is using its analog computing architecture for ultra-low power AI acceleration for sensor data with the aim of adding intelligence into the Internet of Things. I spoke to the CEO of BlueMind, Roger Levinson, to get some details on how the company is planning to add intelligence to edge devices while adding practically no power consumption. Their architecture is analog compute based on moving charge around. A single transistor stores each weight and does the multiplication in the analog domain but then the data is accumulated on capacitors. Because charge measurements are ratiometric, uh, which it means the process isn't sensitive to voltage, the temperature does have to be compensated for to maintain the analog dynamic range. The current version of the architecture is not fully programmable. You have to use BlueMind's neural network, though you can change the weights. Uh, but future versions may have full programmability, he said. For more details, check out my article on BlueMind at eetimes.com. Before we get to the interview, here's a quick message from our sponsor, Acronix. Imagine capturing a soccer stadium full of conversations in real time. With Acronix speeds to 70 FPGAs, this isn't just imagination, it's reality. Acronix automatic speech recognition solution can process 20,000 real time streams with less than 50 milliseconds of latency. Acronix delivers high performance FPGAs designed to accelerate your projects and give you the competitive edge you need to go to market faster. Speedster 7T FPGAs are your ticket to the forefront of conversational AI. Talk to Acronix about your requirements today at go.acronix.com slash ASR. Simmer.ai is a Silicon Valley edge chip company started in 2018. 
The company has an SOC design for computer vision at the edge, featuring a 50 tops AI accelerator that uses just five watts. The company doesn't really shout about its hardware, preferring to focus on software story, which is centered on this one click and it just runs kind of tool chain. I had a very enjoyable chat with Simmer.ai CEO Krishna Rangasi to try and get an overview of what's on the hardware and why. Okay. Hello, Krishna, and welcome to the show. Thank you, Sally. Happy to be here. So Krishna, tell us, uh, Simmer.ai, you're an edge AI chip company and you do make your own chips, although you don't really talk very much about it. You prefer to focus on your software story, which we will absolutely come to uh, later in the show. But first off, I wanted to ask, you know, tell us about the uh, chip that you've been working on. It's an SOC design. What's on the chip and why? Yeah, I think it's a great question. And yes, it's an absolutely conscious choice for us to not talk about our silicon. Um, somebody once told me, when you do something well, you talk about something else. So, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, um, and and, and I, I've been a student of this market for a long, long time, and, and not just embedded alone, but particularly for AI, every company seems to be in a reasonably good shape building silicon, and everybody's actually seal seems to be the software. And it's amazing that it ends up being an afterthought for the vast majority of the biggest companies, the smallest companies. So not that we just want to do something different for the sake of it. The only real way to add value is through the vehicular software. So that's really been our thesis from day one. There's also the reason why we don't end up amplifying too much about our silicon story. And the thesis we came to is the less we talk about our technology and more we talk about how we help customers, seems to be a much better way to go too, right? But I'm happy to cover color on the silicon as well. But, and as you said, we'll talk about our software surely later too. So what we build from a silicon perspective is a product called MLSOC. Um, our thesis was that I think while ML is really here to stay and really gonna be the long-term compute shift for everything from a traditional compute perspective, it's going to take time, particularly in the embedded market, for people to move from classic SOC design, uh, which is really involving traditional compute, one arm and compute, to move to an ML environment, and that people are not going to take the risk of pivoting overnight. And they will need a risk mitigated phased approach to really transition their existing platforms and software into an ML environment. And so we decided to deliver ML in the context of an SOC. So the thesis is you could run everything you're running today just like it, and in an hour you got yourself up and running. And then you could come back and go, okay, what portions of your traditional problem do you want to move into an ML context? Right. So that's really, really simple thesis behind what we did, and and it makes sense to anybody that I talk to in five years, every single customer, every single investor. But then I wonder, so why isn't everybody else doing the same thing? <laughs> right. <laughs> But I'm happy that I think our customers really enjoy the element of what we provide. So in the context of an ML SOC, if you dig deeper, we provide a heterogeneous compute platform. So we have a quad A53 ARM processor subsystem that fundamentally does our control plate processing and really also provides an opportunity for customers legacy code or analytics on top of it. We have a EV74 core, which is a DSP vector engine from Synopsys. Um, and that provides you with a lot of computer vision pre post processing libraries and capabilities. And then we also have a computer vision pipeline because our fundamental start gen one has really been around doing a great job for computer vision, though we could do more than that, but we really want to be good at that. So we have an encode decode computer vision pipeline. So fundamentally think of it as any classic computer vision SOC today. Along with that, we have our own proprietary ML accelerator. Um, and that, I mean, I, I, I think TerraOps is such an over-abused term, but I'll just use it to frame the context of our performance power profile. So think 50 TerraOps class performance at a five watt profile. Right. And and so so yeah. and, and the embedded world is a very power efficient world. I mean, it's either a five watt profile, a ten watt profile, or a twenty watt profile. So we wanted to fit into all three of those profiles. And so okay. and, and we have usual suspect IOs that the embedded world needs. And so if you really look at our chip, it's everybody's SOC 
plus a secret sauce of a machine learning accelerator. So people can run their code, they know the beast, and they have zero friction in really using our product if they've used something else all along. And no doubts, I think, um, to, to the conversation you kicked us off, we, we, we go all the way to not even talk about it. So <laughs> <laughs> but one thing I would say we are proud of is brand new company, we took our A0 silicon production with zero bugs. And that's really, really hard to do. Yeah. And yeah. Um, and very few companies have done it, and um, and really an amazing team. And but I do tell my silicon team that we are a software company that is also building a silicon. And so okay, it's yeah. not, Got not it. one versus the other; it's one with the other. So yeah. and hopefully yeah. that gives you. Yeah. Listeners' it context. It does. I mean, I have to ask. I mean, me being me, and this podcast is about um, AI chips in detail. Um, we like to, to to talk to get down into the weeds, kind of on this yeah. show. Um, I have to ask, what's in the secret sauce? You know, what's in the um, ML accelerator, fifty tops ML accelerator? Can you tell us anything more about how you do it and what's in there? Yeah. No. I I think uh, in some ways it's a innovation of tens of different innovations. And so I mean, people ask us all the time. So no doubts, we participated at MLPerf. We just wanted to get publicly validation that we end up, no secret, we end up competing with NVIDIA every day. So we just wanted to tell everybody that, hey, let's not even waste our time on us being better than NVIDIA. Here's proof. And now let's talk about other things, right? And life doesn't live on benchmarks alone. But even in that context, we are the one private company that's done better than them in performance and power. The data is all out there in the public. But what matters to us as customers, what matters to us is delivering system performance and power and TCO that they care about. So going back to what we've really done, ironically, if I look back and how are we able to achieve this performance power profile, the we have innovated a lot in mat malls. We have done a lot of innovation around our stream processing of uh, the array, and we have shared details of it in certain forums of it's a 10 by 10 array. And, and really, I think we figure out a way to get this array of ML processing engines to really come together to create our ML accelerator. A lot of good innovation there. We have patented quite a bit. We have shared in a few technical conferences details around what we've done. But ironically, if you really look at why are we able to get the performance and the power, far less to do with our map pulse and our ML engine. Data management and, and, and memory management is really the secret sauce for where you can get out the most performance and power, right? So it's kind of underwhelming that for an ML company, our significant innovation is actually data <laughs> management. <laughs> but that's the sad truth. It's, Getting things into memory, getting things out of memory consumes an enormous amount of power and performance is lost along those lines. Data management on the chip is also the other secret sauce. So if I were to pair it to how we got to where we are, it's really around number one, memory management. Number two, data management. Third, no doubts, we have really innovated quite significantly on our ML accelerator and the way we have gone about orchestrating it, right? So, so those would be the three paradigm. But the higher order bit on the performance and power is we have probably one of the most software-centric architectures in the industry that I can think of. Uh, I think yeah, it's become fashionable for everybody to say, hey, we are a software-first company or we're a software-centric company. But the number of people actually doing it is not too many from my perspective. And, and I'd like to believe we are one of those. Um, and so what we've really done is kind of moved every significant problem that we could think of from a software perspective. And our thesis was nobody knows the future in AI and ML. Yeah. Every month it's just going to churn. CNNs were cool for some time, then it became vision transformers, now it's multi-model models. The one thing constant has changed. And we really wanted to give ourselves the best chance. And silicon business is unforgiving. You do something, it sticks for four years. It takes three years to build it. Nobody knows how to predict the future for seven years. I, mean, I wish all of us were smart. I, said, I wish I was smart. We're not. So we said, let's really pivot as much of our capacity to be in line with the innovation of where things go and delivering more of a software-centric experience. And, and our silicon ends up really being a delivery mechanism for our software. Right? And so that's really kind of how we thought about the problem. But trust me, I think if you talk to my silicon guys, they'd be really annoyed that 
we aren't really talking about a silicon in granular details in what we've done. It's a pretty complicated piece of silicon. It really is. Uh, and we were also able to deliver value perhaps staying back at 16 nanometer. Right? So it's just 10-year-old silicon technology. And our next gen will be interesting, which we haven't talked about yet, but uh, we'll be disclosing sometime soon. But 16 nanometer and being able to be the best in what we are able to do, that kind of validates our architecture and our approach. Picking up on flexibility um, and being software centric there, I, I bring it back to hardware again because that's kind of who I am. Um, you have four, <laughs> you have four ARM Cortex A65, I think, yeah. on your chip. These are quite serious um, application processors. Yeah. Do you use those for flexibility in terms of new operators or unsupported operators, or, or what do you use the A65s for, and why do you need four of them? Wow. If, if, if you ever feel like podcasts and writing articles is not exciting enough, you want a full-time role as a company, you could call Krishna at Simaradeya. Just send me an email. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Great question. So our core ML engine, and we've been public about this, is an Intate engine. Yeah. No doubt. We do quite well in quantization. We want to keep the world at Intate for all the practical benefits of performance, power, footprint, da, 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 right? So, so we do all that. We also have a DSP vector engine that does both pre-processing and post-processing. But if somebody wants an FP rendition for a layer to be higher accuracy or for whatever reason we don't support an operator, we can throw it at the DSP vector engine as well. Yes, no doubts. We can also throw it at ARM. But very rarely do we end up putting it on the compute just because to a certain degree, if you look at if you were to normalize things running on a CPU or an ARM complex at one, you typically tend to be five to 10X on the DSP. Okay. And you typically then tend to be 400 to 500X on the ML accelerator, right? So inherently, we kind of really, really want to focus on uh, pushing things into the ML accelerator as much as we can. And then we pair it to, there are a few operators or a few functions we run on ARM. It's a pretty beefy ARM core. Uh, but very rarely, and we fundamentally still end up using it for number one, legacy support for application support. Number two, we definitely use it for control and control plane applications. And number three, invariably, the output from the ML engine ends up being analytics slash reporting out function on the ARM process, right? So that's typically the use case of what we've really done. And, 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 and I have to validate that Arm has just been an absolutely phenomenal, good company for us to work with. So. Yeah, I was uh, I was going to ask about Arm actually. For for a lot of the um, edge AI chips in your class, we're seeing a lot of interest in Risk Five right now. I say for edge AI, but for everywhere for AI, we're seeing a lot of interest in Risk Five right now. Um, tell us about why you picked Arm over Risk Five, and how did you choose between them? <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I think you probably will end up creating a lot of stir around any of our conversation around this topic. <laughs> so, yeah, and, and, and I've been a student of processing structures for a long time, too. And, and it really comes down to, it's not really an ISA question at all. It's really a software ecosystem yeah. and, and a capacity to scale, right? So if we had a closed process subsystem. In other words, if it was just controlling things inside and we own the entire vertical software stack, I would say risk v is a pretty darn good option. Uh, yeah. and, and over the last few years, it's matured. Many are using it. And 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 no doubts, I think it's a fantastic architecture and ISA for that particular use case. What we are creating is really an open platform. Yeah. And we one day are going to entertain tens of thousands, if not 40, 50,000 customers running their application on top of us. And if you look at an open system for the embedded market, software ecosystem is paramount. It kind of becomes your Pareto number one choice in what you go look to. And while the risk five ecosystem is strengthening, I think it's far, far away from where we would feel comfortable that that be our primary compute engine, if you will, right? Because the amount of, I mean, ARM's been around 30, 40 years, and, um, and, 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 and to a certain degree, the ecosystem and the planet kind of runs ARM. Yeah. And, and so we, as a startup, need to be careful how much risk we take. 
I mean, our, our innovation is eventually another day delivering an AI ML experience. And so I, I'm a bit, I've been a student of at any given point, you not be taking more than three risks. But even a big company, uh, yeah. let alone a yeah. startup. And so we don't want to take on evangelizing battles. We don't want to really take on a software ecosystem that's non existent and saying, hey, this is the future, jump on my bandwagon. So we want to keep it focused on where we want to innovate. And ARM is best in class in what they've done. And, and so yep, I think, I, I don't even know how many people use ARM for the embedded edge AI market. I actually haven't done a thesis, but I know I'm on the rare few category. But I also would submit to you that we are probably the primary SOC rendition of ML. Yes. Right? So almost yeah. everybody's an ML accelerator. Yes. And if you're an accelerator and you're fundamentally doing control plane applications and orchestrating data on your own chip, you're not really kind of exposing the risk five to anybody else. Yeah. Right? And so, so I, I would say I'm not surprised that a lot of people are using risk five, but if you really build an SOC, and, and I think we are creating kind of a new product category from our perspective and how edge and ML should scale, I have a feeling that most successful companies will take a similar approach and, and they'll have to cross this chasm. But for today, I would say ARM is a no-brainer choice for us. Yeah. Uh, for today, uh, for sure. Uh, but in the kind of in the longer term, like <laughs> how, do you, how do you feel about it longer term? How do you think it's going to play out this battle? I I think there is enough space for everybody. You know, okay. I, I I I think uh, very diplomatic. Yeah. No, Simon from previously your arm, great friend of mine. I just had coffee at the mess today. Rene, good friend of mine at ARM, and, and, and it's beyond friendship and such. It's really that I think they've built a fantastic company, a fantastic ecosystem, and their IP is world class. So, yeah, we absolutely would love to keep them honest too. You know? and, and if there is a day where Risk V is the better way for us to go, we would consider that. At the end of the day, I think we have to do what's right for our customers and, and for us. But I would say it's still a long ways away. And yeah. I, I think. Uh, maybe we'll disclose our Gen 2 in a few months, and, and you'll see that I think, I mean, no surprise, that I think we want to keep it to where I think the market, I, I, I'll use this phrase, why do people rob banks? Because that's where the money is. <laughs> <laughs> why do people use ARM? Because that's where people <laughs> want it. Yeah, oh, yeah, I get it, I get it. Um, Okay, I know you said a, a part of the the reason for ARM is about the software ecosystem. So maybe let's let's come to the the software story now. Um, your marketing's always been really strong on this one click or this push button. Uh, just you know, push one button and it compiles, it runs. You can do any model, any framework. And tell us about why this is such an important uh, capability. No, it's it's mission critical. I mean, I, I think. Uh, in my previous company, I was in a public company before, and I spent 20 years studying this market. And the thing that I came to the conclusion is, and true, you, I mean, and exacerbated more on AI and ML is number one, it's a software world. Number one. Number two, particularly in the context of AI and ML, the very best of our customers have one or two or three AI people. Uh, um, and, and, and it's really hard getting talent for any company in the planet. But not too many bright students from bright universities get into really most of our embedded customers. That's not the natural ground they go to. You know, they want to be at OpenAI or Anthropic or something cool and Google or Meta. Hardware is cool, thank you. I, I think I, hardware is cool. I, I think so. I think so. <laughs> but but uh, I mean, I, I'm not 20 years old and stepping out of yeah. university and stuff. Neither, right? am I, so, neither am I, sadly. Yeah, <laughs> and so so if you really look at the look at the uh, difficulty that I think this industry has, is everybody wants AI and ML, but not the investment profile and not the learning curve. So yeah. mission critical that the software experience be very simple, where everybody gets the benefit of AI and ML without the learning curve, right? And so so that's really the overarching thesis behind why we have gone out of our way. And actually, I think you start this off by saying we hide the silicon story from our customers. We actually are trying to hide the software story from our customers. 
<laughs> you don't want them to know anything. You know, it's like, and, and, and um, yeah, our, our, a good joke is this US brand called Betty Crocker. And people have always coined this thing called the Betty, Betty Crocker moment, where you just add water and it's magic. You know, and, and that's it. That's then you make a cake. And so, so the reason why we really created an any framework is just any computer vision model, any computer vision uh, uh, ML framework, uh, agnostic to any ML framework, and everything we do is open source, right? It's, it's Linux, it's OpenCV, it's OpenCLS. We want to minimize the friction of bringing anything onto us. So the on-ramp should be really frictionless. So people should not have to do something out of whack to really jump on it. And so we also joke, we call ourselves the Jerry Maguire company. And, and you had me at hello. You know? <laughs> Love it. And there's a lot later story, hey, show me the money, but hey, we'll get to that. <laughs> So, but yeah, that comes to, later. Yeah, that yeah. comes later. But but if you don't get me at hello, you're yes. really hurting as a startup, and you're really hurting at if somebody has to do a circus act to get however amazing you are, nobody's going to do it, right? Nobody has time, nobody has bandwidth. So that's why we created it. And so it wasn't really that we went engineering out and saying let's build something cool. We really said we need to really make sure that people can click a button and work with us. I don't have an army of tens of thousands of people that can hand code and optimize and build things for a customer. We're a very small company, but we really wanted to spend four or five years building a really, really good software product where people could really bring anything and come into us, right? So that we have done a good job. The back end of the compiler is really also a very difficult thing on our push button. And if our customers really have to go layer by layer and optimize and get this accuracy and this performance and this, the, other, the very biggest of them have the talent, the capacity to go do it. And it's expensive AI and training. And I mean, all of this is expensive and it's expensive on people, expensive on computer infrastructure. We want to provide the least path of resistance for our folks. So we also, since I'm full of analogies today, we call ourselves the Ellis Island of ML. Okay. <laughs> give us your poor, give us your tired, give us your hungry. <laughs> <laughs> and once you come in, you're American. You know? <laughs> okay. Well, and, I and like so, that idea. Yeah. And, 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 and I mean, I think if you were to look at a common theme of everything we're talking about, the biggest thing we really spent the years analyzing, and particularly I've been a steward of this, two things. What are customer pain points? And how do we get them to be comfortable to choose a new path? Yeah. Right? So every choice that we have made is pivoted from that learning. And I almost joke to people, we are a technology company, but we are more a listening company. Right? Okay. And, and we just have watched and watched and watched. And we don't want to do a build it and they'll come because that doesn't happen in a market. Listen carefully and spend four hours understanding what they're trying to really do. And then spend two hours doing what they need, right? And so that's kind of really been our focus. And so our technology choice, our architecture choice, our silicon rendition, all of it is an outcome of that thinking. Yeah. So if a push button compiler, I'll just push one button and it just works. It's great that it runs first time or great that it runs every time, um, but yeah. how good is the performance? Do I then have to write it by hand then for deployment or is this is this going to be good enough for deployment as well? That's right. So great, great question. So we support 220 ML models. Great. So very few companies, even the biggest of them has 35, 40, 50. Yeah. And the, in the, in the way we think about the problem is in computer vision, there are 13 verticals. Could be match classification, semantic segmentation, re -identification. So, so we've broken the 13 verticals. We have populated the best ML models, that, whether it's YOLO v7 or image, or whatever the flavor of the day is, right? And we keep adding to the model zoo. So we have a model zoo, we keep adding to it. And everything in there is all push button. And so people don't need to do anything at all, right? But no doubts, people would want to do things beyond our models. And we cannot just be a one-trick pony of, hey, everything I tell you is going to be great and everything else sucks. 
So that's not the answer for the world either. This is why the any front end really makes a lot of sense, where people could bring their own thing. And are they going to get the 100% best performance possible out of the shoot? No, maybe not. They get 80%. But it's still way better than everybody else because inherently our ML engine is outpacing everybody else from a performance power perspective. No doubt, every company wants more than what they get. And maybe there's some elbow grease involved or not, but we want to keep 80, 90% of the world that not touching our hand coding. Yeah. I don't want to preserve that. And so if you think about it, for computer vision, 220 models is a lot of ML models to play around. <laughs> yeah. And we see customers really want to stay there because they want to get the end result. I mean, and, and they want to really be able to deliver it. If we had a really poor underlying silicon, if it were just to be a CPU company, of course, they would be struggling for performance. But I think performance and power has been less of anybody's concern. And we've really also done a good job on quantization and really keeping them delivering the highest accuracy too. So, yeah. so we're, we're trying to keep our customers at really not going down the path of hand code. For the super ninjas that absolutely love it and they can't sleep at night if they don't do it, sure, we have methodology guidelines, we have design guides, we have a lot of ways to really help them. But it, we also announced this product called um, Palette Edge. Palette's our software and, and the name of our software. And Edgematic is really a drag and drop menu. So we provide you 220 ML models, we provide you 70, 80 pre post processing libraries. You could just drag and drop and click and construct a complicated computer vision pipeline in minutes. You then push a button, and all of this runs on a remotely hosted device on AWS, and it immediately gets back to you with the KPIs on performance, power, latency, memory utilization, everything you want to do as an engineer, right? That's pretty compelling. And this was, as you know, normally takes months to really get that full cycle of, I did yeah. something, got some results, and I don't like it, and now what do I do, right? So we have this theme of months to minutes. And, and that's really, I think, the key thing that we're driving. Yeah, I can imagine it uh, being able to compile very quickly and test very quickly helps uh, when you're developing as well, right? You can do iterations, try out different models, try out different things, and kind of and work yeah. quickly and see how it works, right? I, I think for how much of a silicon geek I personally am, it's pretty amazing that I've become a software person. <laughs> <laughs> it's red. It's red fast, you know, and, and and so so but we operate that way as a company. Um, software obviously, you know, is a is a primary focus for you. Can you imagine a future where you make your palette or you make your software work for other hardware and just become a software company, or is it too tightly linked to the hardware at this point? You, you should definitely join our board. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, sure. I, I, I just, no, I, I actually, in full disclosure, uh, so we are inherently built in such a way that we could support different silicon. And the reason for that is this. We know we're going to do more than computer vision. We're starting with computer vision. I cannot have a monolithic put footprint that's so intertwined that I can do only one thing, right? So we abstract all of our software to an intermediate representation. And the back end of it is no doubt topical to where we are. Everything in intermediate representation is agnostic to the architecture. And so in that context, if at all we were to be really thinking about one day, we could have a different business model. But for now, we're not convinced that that's the right way for us to really go. And But we need that structure because we just need to pivot to new problems. And maybe we are in the enterprise AI space one day. Maybe we are in communications infrastructure and maybe beam forming is all going to become ML based one day, right? And so yeah. we want to be able to pivot. Software, we don't want to pivot. And so that's so, so silicon you could churn. Yeah. Software's free, it's the company, if you will. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. What do deployments look like for Edge AI chips today? Who's selling chips today and into what kind of markets? What I hear is that adoption has been a little slower than expected, maybe. Does that fit with what you see and, and what's happening? Yeah, no, I, I think you know, having spent 20 years studying this market, so the good news is it's thousands of customers. So there's no win big or go home. 
It's a very forgiving business at Masper. I have joked, even if you lose 20,000 customers, you have 20,000 more to go. <laughs> sure. If you're a hyperscaler business, it's really tough. You, you, you lose one, you lost your company, right? So it's forgiving. Uh, but the, uh, and then software, that's why it's really also critical for this market compared to perhaps other market segments. But the difficulty is that this is slower to on-ramp on revenue. It takes time. In some markets like automotive, qual and certification, because it touches human lives, it really takes on a longer complexity. <clears throat> but invariably, this market is slower to on-ramp in revenue. And, and the volume per customer tends to be lower than the other places. So that's just the, the nature of the game. Luckily, we have investors that really understand it well, and they are patient. They want to really help us scale this company and are bought into the long-term goals for the company. But having said that, the markets that we are prioritizing and focusing on, with computer vision being the underlying priority for the company, is robotics, uh, industrial automation, um, smart vision systems. Uh, we're also getting into medical ag tech, construction tech, and the long game for us is really in automotive. And over the course of this year, I think there'll be some exciting things to talk about in terms of an automotive perspective. So that's really our priority set of where we're focused on. And I would guide you that we're engaged with the top five customers globally on any and all of these market segments. Uh, we have had the luxury of being a company where people are pulling for us versus us pushing for them. Okay. And, and so um, there are some benefits to being old in that you know a lot of people. Um, yep. and so, so, so those have been kind people that have pulled us and said, hey, seems to be quite interesting what you guys are doing. Can you come please tell me how you can help my problem, right? So we have seen a lot of those. But I also think that it's now becoming very clear in the edge market that we are in, that we are beginning to separate ourselves from everybody. And, and so... I think our performance per watt story is very exciting to everybody. And that's what gets us in the door. But what really keeps us there and excited is that I think um, our software story is really a self-managed software and run. So people could really build development and really not throw hundreds of AI engineers to really use us. And they see the benefit of it. And so the combination of the performance per watt and the ease of use is really, I think, key at where we are vectoring. And we are engaged with about five zero customers today globally, 50, mm -hmm. going 100 plus. And so it's super exciting for us to scale where we are. And we're able to do it really because our strength of our software. Yeah. I have to ask uh, about generative AI and uh, and these large language models. You know, oh, do, you see, I, do you see a market for that question. at the edge? I know yeah. you're a vision yeah. company right yeah. now, but are you going to pivot to LLMs? Like, is it cool? Are you going to go there? No doubt. Generative AI is going to become huge at the edge. Huge. And, and for two reasons. One is, I, I, I think, I don't think it's going to happen ever in my mind that we'll ever mimic human uh, capacity. But human capability, I think we could really get into a multi-model world, right? So I think nothing is going to be monolithic vision or audio or text anymore. And it's going to be everything blended in together. And, and throw in privacy and security, which I think are going to become more exacerbated with Gen AI. Invariably, things that will remain at the edge will remain at the edge. But everything at the edge I see is going to remain multimodal. And uh, not perhaps LLM, but LMM, large multimodal models, are probably going to be the norm. Now, you could quote me on that if you want. <laughs> I think you <laughs> make I, that I, up. <laughs> No, no, I, 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 no I, I wish I could take credit for the term LMM, mm -hmm. uh, but I definitely see there are a few others that I think I've been talking about this for a while, but it's moving beyond academic into production platforms, and we're already yeah. seeing it. But large multimodal models, LMMs, are probably going to become the main focus for the next five years. And within that, there's going to be a lot of innovation, but that vector is going to carry us. <clears throat> and today, we are not announcing what we are going to be doing, but I think I'll let everybody connect the dots that if that's what I believe in, uh, what we do about it, we'll talk about it in a little while. So, But LMMs, I think, are going to be the rules. But 
that's going to be the subset of technology bases behind generative AI at the edge. Yeah, I mean, I was going to ask about like, are you going to do some next gen hardware or what's on your software roadmap? You already gave us a quite quite a few hints. Uh, yeah. I know you've got next gen silicon coming. I talked about automotive. You talked about these LMMs. Um, yeah, what what's your vision or what are your what are your plans for 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 the next couple of years? Let's say. In the space, so we would probably suck at a lot of other domains. <laughs> okay. I, I, and we are not one size fits all for everything. But the domain that we are in, we are really, really keen on being the best choice for everybody. And we want to be the easiest to use just as a company, not just software alone. We really want to be the easiest partner for everybody. Uh, that's really our philosophy. And we really want to be known to be the best technology developer for the space and the best customer partner for the space. And we really want to see the industry change to an AI ML adoption. So if you think through what is intelligent semiconductor consumption in the space that we are in, it's about 40 billion on an annual basis. So these are good companies like NXP, ST, Renaissance, um, AMD, so a lot of, lot of companies that are servicing this market today. Uh, if you look at the AI ML participation in this market space, it's 0.5%. Okay. So 99.5% of the consumption is still classic compute. Yeah. And I think in this decade, that will start shifting quite heavily. And we would like to see ourselves be a pioneer or a leader that's instrumenting the change and helping our customers with the transition. So that's our vision. And if we do that in the next two, three years, it'd be good. And then I'll spend the next two, three years thinking through what we want to do after that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not a bad place for us to be. And so, so far, so good. And I would say in five years, uh, we have done reasonably well. And we just want to be paranoid and maniacally focused on our customers, put our head down, be humble, and try to see if we can make a good company out of ourselves. Yeah. Sounds like a great vision. Krishna, thank you so much. I really enjoyed our conversation. Same here, Sally, and really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you very much, Krishna Rangasee, CEO of Simma.ai, for the chat. This episode of AI with Sally was brought to you by Acronix. Thank you very much, Acronix, for sponsoring us. That brings us to the end of the episode. Please tune in again next time to hear more news and views on AI, machine learning, and the technologies that enable them. If you're listening to this on the podcast page at eetimes.com, links to articles and topics we've discussed are shown on your left. AI with Sally is brought to you by Aspen Core Media. The host is Sally Ward-Foxton, and the producer is James Ede. Thank you for listening. <laughs>